Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwa. And yes, it is still the slow season of the NHL, but this week the calendar flips to September, which gets us out of the absolute dead zone that is August. Now, we did get some fun news early in August. Yes, the Eric Carlson trade finally happened, but since then, it's gone as expected nothing of real substance has happened in the penguins world since obviously one of the biggest trades that we've seen in recent penguins history i would say i don't know if i'd go the whole way through penguins history because there's some pretty big trades in the 50 plus years of the pittsburgh penguins if you wanted to you could argue and say it is the largest because technically it is the largest trade in penguins history and you could leave it at that without letting people know by sheer numbers, by number of assets. Yeah. It, there were 12 assets involved, which broke the previous Penguins record of, I think it was only eight or however many were in the Phil Kessel deal. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's definitely the biggest deal in terms of gravity for the team since the Phil Kessel deal. Uh, but in the entire franchise's history, it is the largest uh, trade to ever take place. And that's the thing, is after that, your first inclination is, okay, Kyle Dubas is done. This is the team heading into training camp. Then a couple days later, there are multiple reports that the Pittsburgh Penguins indicate that they are interested in veteran forward Tomas Tatar. Not much has been said since then. And now, PTO season is in full swing. Now, there's a couple of high-profile free agents still available. Patrick Kane springs to mind as one of the top names available on the market, but Thomas Tatar really is healthy, the best name remaining on the free agent market because Patrick Kane's, you know, obviously recovering from an injury and will miss the beginning of the season. We haven't talked about it much because it, it really has been quiet since those initial reports, Horwat. He's coming off a 20-goal season with the New Jersey Devils. He really has scored 20 goals in three of the past five seasons. So this is a guy that you talk about can really come in and boost the Penguins' bottom six scoring pretty much immediately. But from what it seems on the outside looking in is Tatar is weighing his options, and you would have to imagine that he prefers to sign an actual contract and not a PTO. Yeah, that's that, that has to be the assumption. He played all 82 last season with 48 points, including 20 goals. He has a pedigree of deserving far more than just a, a tryout. He has the pedigree of deserving something legitimate from anywhere in the league. He has, he, he has the ability to uh, request a fair amount of money, too. The Penguins, at the moment, really can't afford to pay what he's probably looking for. Um. It, but it's just a matter. I think for the Penguins, it's just a matter of how quickly can they get to the point of, well, he has no other options. I mean, normally, you know, you hear what they say during the opening of free agency. Well, by the time you get to the third or fourth day, the money's gone. All the big, all the teams have signed their big contracts. Uh, usually, that's handled on the first day. Second day, there's kind of just some floaters, a big name or two. Once you get this deep in, it's either. You're looking at scrap money or you're signing PTOs and hoping for the best. I mean, the teams, I mean, who knows exactly what Tatar is willing to look for um, in terms of money. I forget how much he's coming off of. Uh, you would have to assume at this point, though, he's taking a pay cut, right? Oh, 100%. 100% he's taking a pay cut. And at this point, you know, that's the question that I wanted to ask you as well is what is the most the Penguins can afford to pay a guy like Thomas Tatar, because when we initially had started thinking about him as an option, a lot of people, including me, were thinking, okay, he's probably like a $3 million, $3.5 million player. But as time goes on, the reality is that that money is getting lesser and lesser because there is less demand for you. Because like you mentioned, Horwat, all these teams have things pretty much figured out by August 29th. Mm -hmm. At this point, Tatar is going to be a cherry on the top for whichever team he signs with and usually the cherry on the top doesn't get a whole lot of money yeah it's it's that last little here not even league you can go a little over league minimum but it's the last little yeah. here's the fun player um he, he's coming off a contract that was two years 
two years long, making him $4.5 million annually uh, against the cap. So uh, you, at this point, you assume he's not going to make that much. It can't be mm-hmm. at 4.5. It's going to have to be a pay cut, a reduced salary from there. But how far down can you go? Because, I mean, yeah, not many teams could afford it. He's still able to demand a pretty fair amount of money. Like I said, he had 48 points last year as a, I would assume third liner on that team on the devils. It's a good team. That was a good team last year. Um, but also has a 60 point season under his belt has a 50, even though that one was kind of far along ago. Um, but he seems pretty consistent too. He's pretty usually playing 70, 80 games a season. Uh, he's going to be able to demand a fair chunk of change. And it's questionable if the penguins can afford it. Yeah, he's durable, which is important for the Pittsburgh Penguins, a team that is right now looking for somebody to step up and take command of that role of being the third line player that, if needed, could possibly step into a top two line role. I mean, you look at Jake Gensel's already injured and they're going to need somebody for the first handful of games. But when I look from the Penguins perspective, I don't see how they can afford to bring him in for anything over one and a half million dollars. And that's yeah. pushing it based on what I'm seeing. Now, I'm not a capologist. I'm not getting paid to make sure that the Penguins are under the salary cap. There are other people that do get paid and probably have better ideas than me. But at $1 million, this is the scenario I came up with in my head when I was looking at them on Cap Friendly. If they sign Tomas Tatar for $1 million, one, that's a f- phenomenal value. And two, that probably means you're one of the only teams that were in on, on Thomas Tatar at this stage of the game. But if they get him at $1 million, they could send Rem Pitlick through waivers at $1.1 million and they would be cap compliant. Cut and dry, that would be oh. it. That's the easiest way to go about it. The only problem is, I'm not sure Thomas Tatar is going to sign for $1 million until it is his very last option. Yeah. Yeah, and would that also bring the assumption that he comes here on a PTO first? Because who knows if he even wants to sign a PTO or if he wants to just take a straight deal and have some certainty. There's all kinds of questions that go into the Thomas Tatar thing. And also you have to figure if you're bringing a player like that on, you're losing another valuable piece that you may have been looking forward to having in your lineup. Like you just mentioned, Rem Pitlick through waivers. I I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what Rem Pitlick can do with this team. I mean, his roster spot isn't guaranteed, but I mean, he's got the contract, AKA $1.1 million dollars worth of deserving a spot in the lineup in a way and also uh being part of the eric carlson deal uh to bring him in there's all kind of factors that go into him possibly reaching the lineup but you know you bringing someone like tatar in means you lose another big name maybe that means old chari ends up getting the can somewhere uh drew o'connor who again we had a couple discussions about him this summer maybe he ends up losing a job because of this um not that it also it feels like the Penguins already have enough of ro- enough roster battles going on, right? It feels like there's already enough happening that they don't need to add on another uh, top end talent like Thomas Tatar, but he adds to the competition as well, no matter what he arrives with. And I think he instantly becomes the Penguins' best bottom six player. I, I oh, mean, absolutely! It, it, it spe- especially offensively. So you talk about that, you know, he would replace a guy like Drew O'Connor. And while, yes, we've both been bullish on Drew O'Connor, we think he's going to have a tremendous season for the Pittsburgh Penguins and hope to see him become an everyday player and play, you know, 60, 70, maybe even up to 80 games this season. But if you have a chance to bring in a guy like Tatar, I know that he's a little bit older, but 20 goals in three of the past five seasons, that is a solid presence of scoring in your bottom six. And, and, And we can talk about it here in a second, but it is also somebody that you're very comfortable with if he needs to play that top six minutes. And that's where, when I look at Rem Pitlick, when I look at Drew O'Connor, it's like, yeah, do I think that they could get to that level? Potentially. But Tomas Tatar has proven to be able to get to that level. And that sense of security uh, is always a good thing for general managers and head coaches to be able to know, hey, listen, we have a guy that is middle six, normally, top, top line at his best. And he's proven to be that to have him just kind of stowed on the third line and also hopefully producing on the third line uh, is something that the Penguins, I'm not going to say need, 
a need is a you know when you use the word need some people say it just hey they they need a, they need more scoring in the bottom six yeah i agree do they absolutely 100 need it to be successful no they don't but you know if he comes in at one million dollars it's hard to dispute signing that contract and bumping a guy like Rem Pitlick down to the minors. If he clears waivers, of course. That's always the big one too, is if he clears, <clears throat> if he clears waivers. Um, I mean, Kyle Dubas already said, he's not going to be afraid to utilize them if he needs to. Mm -hmm. So I, that we don't know what that means. We don't know if that's a directed shot at somebody that he might have in mind or everybody um, or everybody. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, it's possible that he's talking to Jeff Carter in that situation. I mean, that's not going to happen, but yeah, there's, throwing there's names no out, advantage there, but yeah, there's not. And he can say no to it. So, <laughs> but it's anybody is every, anybody and everybody's on the chopping, chopping block when it comes to the bottom six, mm -hmm. there are let's there's six positions down there. And quite honestly, there's six spots to fill. And, and by that, I mean, I know I just repeated the same thing. They're all open. They're all open. They, you may say, yeah, Lars Ellis me third line center, which he most likely is, but that spot's still up for grabs. Jeff Carter could come in and say, here, I'm having a resurgent year to close out my career. The Hall of Fame is in my eyes. I need this. He comes in and comes in like a house of fire and steals that spot. You never know. I mean, an off season is exactly what this kind of thing is for, for rebuilding yourself, adding to what you can bring. And let's say Jeff Carter can do something like that. Well, then Lars Eller, not, not going to say out of a job, but is suddenly in a different position. Same goes for the fourth line. I mean, we thought Nola Chari was the go-to guy. Well, hey, we added Rem Pillick, who might be able to cut it there as well. Now there's all kind of what exactly is going to happen. There are six open positions down at the bottom six, and maybe Tomas Tar flies in there and makes his case. Maybe Brian Russ flies in there and makes his case. There's all kind of weird situations that could happen with this bottom six. Um, and it'll be it'll be an interesting camp. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings me to an interesting point. I'm glad you brought up Brian Rust. If they pull off the T T Tomas Tatar deal, whatever the money is, Tatar's on the, on the team. He's going to make the team. Where do you play him? Do you start him? You know, let's say Gensel's healthy, because obviously when you bring him in, if Gensel's still out, you put Tatar there, you plug and play, and it oh. becomes a pretty easy answer. But with Gensel healthy, do you put Tatar over Brian Rust to start the season in your eyes? I think so. I, I think Tomas Tatar enters this team while we are having this big discussion of um, bottom six presence. Uh, the only issue, I would say he can also play in the top six. The only thing that might hold him back a little bit is the positioning of him being a left winger first. Uh, mm -hmm. whereas yeah, he'd, be, he'd have to play his off wing, he'd have to play his off wing. So you don't know if there's a, a level of comfort there. Um, but in terms of the grand, the grand scheme of things, if you're looking at just a, just a forward depth chart, there is no position staple to it. Uh, in my eyes, I think heading into this season without any games played yet, Thomas Tatar would enter uh, the season higher up on the depth chart. If you could put it like that. Mm. Um, not by much. I mean, it's, they're pretty close in that, in that, uh, on that chart, but it's, I would give Tatar the upper hand just for now. I mean, especially considering the season they both had last year, if I can quickly find Brian Russ stats, he had 20 be, goals as well. Also at they 20, both scored 20. Yeah. 20 and 20 Tatar's 28 assists and Russ. How many assists? Let's pull that. <laughs> 26 so they're fairly close fairly yeah. close but there was something that there was something about Rust's season though offensively that just left a bad taste in everyone's mouth it was the fact that it was a not a big decline but a pretty sizable and noticeable decline uh, in terms of scoring not so much goal scoring he only had four fewer goals that'll happen but uh, that playmaking ability took a setback and he'd have he would have to find his groove again to prove that he is deserving of uh, a top six role or playing alongside Sidney Crosby, especially whenever um, we know his defensive acumen is there. He got utilized on the penalty kill quite a bit uh, throughout the season. And we know that that's going to be the driving force behind the bottom six. Is that, is that defensive skill? Mm -hmm. I think at least in my eyes, that fits him well to start the season and, 
gain different momentum. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing about Brian Rust last season. Despite the fact that offensively, it seemed like something was off. The opportunities were still there for him. Now, part of that is because of who he was playing alongside. I mean, he was he was up with Crosby a, a good portion of the season. It was basically 50-50 at five on five. He was either with Crosby or with Malkin. Very few times was he actually off of one of those two lines. So the opportunities were there. He just wasn't able to, to capitalize on them. And that was uncharacteristic for Brian Rust. I'm very bullish on Brian Rust entering this season because I think that he bounces back. I, I think he bounces back in, in a big way. Mm-hmm. Um, this season, because I think that the thing, the the lineup is more geared towards him succeeding, meaning he's not going to be forced to be on the first penalty kill unit, as well as the top power play, as well as the second power play. I mean, he was on the ice a whole heck of a lot in situations that were not five on five last year. Hence, part of the reason that his five on five numbers declined. I think that that is going to change this season. And I think Brian Russ is going to be better for it. And I think you start him out in the top six, no matter what happens, unless Tatar comes in and severely outperforms Rust in training camp. Like it has to be from opening whistle to the last day of training camp that Tomas Tatar outperforms Brian Rust. Because when you look at Tatar, he's a veteran. He doesn't need to be thrown a cookie. Right, He can start in the bottom six and then be bumped up, and that's fine. And not to say that Brian Russ needs a cookie, but one of these guys in Tatar is likely going to come in on a one-year deal, two years max. I don't think that that happens at this stage of the offseason, but maximum, he gets a two-year deal. Brian Russ has five years left. You need Brian Russ to be better more than you need Thomas Tatar to hit. So I think you start Brian Rust on the second line, try to get him kicked off in the right way for a season where he's hoping to bounce back. And I, I, like I said, I'm bullish. I think he does bounce back, but I think that putting him in the bottom six is only putting another hurdle and another obstacle in front of a player that you need to hit way more than Thomas Tatar. Yeah. And there's all kinds of factors that also lead into this still too, that we haven't even discussed because you're saying start Brian Rust on the second line. Who's your yes. first line player? Ricard Raquel. Yes. Boom. Another, another, insp- <laughs> and that's, and I am in full agree with you there. Ricardo Raquel should be the yeah. first line right where that's, that's, I'm pretty, pretty sure that. everybody listening to this podcast was just like, yes, yes, yeah, please, that- please put Ricardo Raquel on the first line to start the season. Yeah. That one is a, that one is a cut and dry decision of, yeah, that one. We can have the absolutely, we can absolutely have the discussion of Brian Russ playing on the second line. But if that slips, because let's say Alex Nylander steps in, because, you know, Thomas Tatar isn't guaranteed to be at camp. Alex Nylander is. Who knows what he can bring to the table? Yeah. He could slide in and take over as the second line winger next to Evgeny Malkin. Yeah, we know uh, Jake Gensel's in- injured. Maybe Riley Smith bumps to the first line, but Riley Smith as well because Nylander, while it was only a handful of games, played pretty well with Malkin last year. Who says that can't continue again? And then maybe that's what forces Russ down to the third line. There's my thought process behind Russ making it to the third line is his setbacks offensively, but also the amount of opportunities that are going to be had for other players on this team. I mean, I'm not saying a prospect like Valtteri Pustin can get up there, but that's another hat in the ring of let's let's make let's add some intrigue, let's throw more names, more faces into this battle of hey, there are six. Spots open in the bottom six. Hell, there might be nine when it comes to the entire bottom three lines forwardly. For it, the bottom three lines of the forwards. Um, and who knows exactly how it all falls. Right, it'll be up to Brian Russ to really make that decision. Yeah, and I would even add that there's there's a spot to be determined in the bonus forward for the Pittsburgh Penguins, too. I mean that spot's open as well to stay on the NHL roster. Now I understand they wouldn't be playing every game, but at this point, when you look at the bottom six, there might be a rotation. I, it's not the best thing to do, but when you have so many unanswered questions as to who works with whom, uh, who has chemistry with who, you might have a rotation. You certainly will in training camp, but you might have a rotation early in the season saying, okay, the guy that's a healthy scratch on night one, might be playing in night two just simply because, hey, we don't know who's going to fit the best when it comes to actual NHL regular season hockey. Now, 
There's a reason they have about a month of training camp to be able to figure that out. Uh, but there is a chance that you get through that month and there's two guys that are neck and neck for that 12th forward spot. And you say, okay, we're going to just plug and play and see what works early in the season because this Pittsburgh Penguins team, especially on the forward side of things and especially in the bottom of the lineup, is very, very different and a lot of new faces. So it's going to be interesting. At the end of the day, the Pittsburgh Penguins are just waiting on Thomas Tatar um, right now to make a decision on if he wants to come to Pittsburgh, it feels like. Um, again, nothing has been reported over the past couple of weeks, but that really is the sense that I'm getting is, hey, Pittsburgh has the door open. If Tatar wants to walk through it, it's is completely and utterly up to him. Um, but it seems like it's going to have to be on a either $1 million, maybe $1.5 million contract, and somebody like a Rem Pitlick or, or somebody else, they would make it work by sending them through waivers. But um, it gets interesting uh, as the – calendar flips to september because you know time is running out for a lot of these uh remaining free agents as pto season is in full swing but we're going to take a quick break and when we return a listener question to talk a little bit more uh, about the goaltender worst case scenario for tristan jari after the break Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. Horwat, I know you didn't watch the show when it was on, but I watched This Is Us, and there was a game that two of the characters played whenever things were getting tough. They played a game called Worst Case Scenario, where they would say, hey, listen, what is the thing you're most afraid of happening in this situation? They'd say it. It would sound ridiculous to say out loud, and then they'd feel better about themselves. Let's do that with Tristan Jari, because this comes to us from Dylan Menzel on Twitter. Listener question says, say Jari doesn't work out this season for whatever reason. Would the Penguins have many options for a trade with him after just signing a five-year, five-plus million dollar contract, or would they have to write it out for the next couple of seasons? Uh, d- Man, because <laughs> <laughs> you have to first come up with well, what is the worst case what scenario? What is the not succeeding? Yeah, what is the not succeeding yeah. of the first season here? Um, and you have to then work with the modified no trade clause, you have to work with uh, those teams that he's willing to be moved to. I would say we're SOL if. Worst case scenario <laughs> happens, really. I mean, maybe not necessarily. Kyle Dubas has worked wonders with goalies before. Um, it's going to be interesting. I'd say when it comes to the worst case scenario, it's just that he can't stay healthy again. Um, we don't think the skill is going to take a step back because we know he has it. We know he can perform, but it's all about performing when he's healthy. Mm-hmm. Worst case scenario might be, him getting injured again and struggling to remain in the lineup on a consistent basis. Uh, That's the biggest one I can think of at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's obvious other things. I mean, if we were talking about Matt Murray, it would be the injuries, the fans not being behind them. And then also that damn glove hand, (laughs) at least Jari, we know the fans should be behind him. I think no matter what, throughout most of last year, we were, the fans were pretty well backing him. Even though he was injured, they were still pretty well saying he's the guy to go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't until, man, that that gaff during the Chicago game really set people off, and maybe there's that certain group that have always been against him since the Islander series. But overall, I would say the fans should at least be behind him, and that won't be an issue. But it, I think the health is worst-case scenario. See, for me, if he gets injured, obviously it's it's not a good thing. That's three straight years that your starting goaltender is dealing with injury, specifically a starting goaltender that you just handed a five-year contract to as well as you know the clauses that you just mentioned. Worst case scenario for me, I think it's much worse if he stays healthy and he underperforms. And by underperforms, I think worst case scenario is you know sub 905 save percentage despite being healthy, actively losing the Pittsburgh Penguins game after game, weak goals at inopportune moments. That to me is the worst case scenario. Is it a likely scenario? No, 
I don't think if he's healthy, he's going to be anything less than top 15 in the National Hockey League. Top 10 is what I'd like to say, but I, I think he's at least a top 15 goaltender if he's fully healthy the entire season. But worst case scenario to me is you don't get that asterisk of, well, he, he was injured. And yeah, he's injury prone. And that sucks. But, you know, if he was just healthy, if he was just healthy, to be able to still say that, to me, doesn't meet, make it worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is, oh man, he was healthy and he still was trash. Like that would be the issue. Um, do I think that's likely? No, I don't think that's likely. I don't, that's why I think it's the worst case scenario. Um, but if that happened and he was healthy and still bad, it would be, you know, there would be other factors that had to play into it in, in my eyes, because I think that one, the performance, of the defense in front of him is also going to be important to factor in. I mean, they finished 18th, the Penguins did, in expected goals against last season, 21st in expected goals against per 60 minutes. Not great. Um, not really good in front of Tristan Jari, Casey DeSmith, uh, Dustin Tokarski, whenever he was out there. But when it comes to just simply Tristan Jari, I still think there are three things, or two things at least, that change the perspective on why he would have a poor performance. If it's injury-related, other teams might still take a shot with four years left. Because they'd say, you know what? Lightning struck three times, but there might be a team out there that says, if he gets healthy, we, we, you know, the contract might be a lot, but the Penguins could retain salary and we could end up getting a pretty good goaltender for the next couple of seasons. But if it's simply performance-based, my worst case scenario, I don't think anybody's, anybody's jumping to take over that contract. No, that's, that's whatever it gets to the point of that's enough of that. You would have to hope maybe Ron Hextall finds a job somewhere and you can just go, hey, here's your guy. Have him back. Um, or Jim Rutherford, maybe. Who knows if he wants to jump on that grenade again. Hmm. There's, yeah, you, that, that is definitely worst case scenario. But I think that's worst case scenario for a lot of people, is it not? We're heading into a new season and, and maybe all of a sudden, hey, Sidney Crosby can't perform anymore. Yeah, that is definitely worst case scenario. But yeah, um, but I see where you're coming from. It is definitely the idea of, well, he's healthy. He just can't stop beach ball. We're looking like it looks like Mark Andre Fleury in the playoffs. It's not consistent with what we know he is. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel that when it comes to the injuries, that's whenever he loses the backing of the fans too. And yeah, he loses the backing of the fans and and pure skill too. But it's more people will, will will lose the backing of the fans if it's if it's injury stuff because it'll be. Jari, obviously, guy can't stay healthy. It'll be Kyle Dubas. Well, why couldn't you? We had all these other options that were out there, trades, free agency, this, that, the other, uh, and you stuck with the guy. Somehow Mike Sullivan probably gets thrown in there for, well, why do you keep playing him? Because we love blaming coaches. I don't know. I, I mean, we have to have a good confidence in Tristan Jari going into this season and then the four years afterwards. So that's the other part of it, too, is if – if injuries or skill setbacks become a thing, you have to, we, the Penguins com and Dubas committed to Jari on a long term basis here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you can't go down in year one struggling in any yeah. way, shape, or form. Yeah. Yeah. He needs to be able to, one, stay healthy, and two, when he's healthy, he needs to show exactly what he showed um, that made. Kyle Dubas comfortable giving him that contract. Now here are, you know, this is really getting into hypothetical land, but it's August 29th. That's going to happen. Here are the options that I see for the Pittsburgh Penguins laid out. If Tristan Jari ends up being somebody that you just need to get rid of, or you need to figure something else out when it comes to your goaltending situation. None of those big three goaltenders got traded this year. And if they're sitting there still putting pressure on their team and saying, listen, I want it out in the summer. Now it's the trade deadline. And the Penguins, let's say, are floating around like ninth, 10th in the Eastern Conference. They need to make a run to make the playoffs, and they want to make a run to make the playoffs because they already went all in with Eric Carlson. If that's the case, and the goaltender is the big thing, I could see one of these teams being like, okay, you know what? Tristan Jari hasn't been all that great, but he's been healthy. We think that it's just a, needs a new situation. And John Gibson or N... Connor Hellebuck really need like really are not happy. The fact that they are still on this roster, then you might be able to do something again. 
contracts get into it. That's the only situation I can see where if Tristan Jari goes sour that quick on this new contract, that's the only situation I could see the Penguins being able to pull a ripcord and, and fall safely with an actual parachute instead of just plummeting to their you know demise at the bottom and the base of a mountain. You're muted. <laughs> yeah, I caught that. Yeah, you have to wonder if Jari uh, played it, played his uh, contract demands correctly, and said, "Okay, you can." My no trade list consists of teams that have goalies that want to be traded. <laughs> he, but just it's the most random list of you know non-negotiable teams. It's it's the Jets, it's the Ducks, it's Nashville, Nashville. It, it, Sorry, it's, yeah. For some reason, Philadelphia. It's Edmonton always gets new goaltenders. You know, Edmonton's on there. The issue with that one is, is that he's from there. Yeah, or true. Played junior there. Uh, it's that one might stay open. The thing is, I don't know if they're willing to give up any goalies. I don't think we'd want Jack Campbell. Oh wait, Kyle Dubas is here. Well, also think about this. Uh, and again, hypothetical land again. I don't think either of us think the worst case scenario is going to happen this season, right? I don't think either of us think that he's going to, at least mine, when he's healthy and sucks. Like, I don't think that happens. He's from Surrey, British Columbia. Might like the Vancouver Canucks, and I think the guys at the Vancouver Canucks might like him as well. I don't know. That's your Demko. Already... Oh, stop with the Thatcher <laughs> Demko thing. I already brought up Jim Rutherford maybe wanting him back, and you're right. There's, <laughs> and yeah, I was off by by a couple of provinces whenever I said he's from Edmonton, but you understand the Edmonton oil Kings. Yeah. That's where you were played at. juniors. Yeah. I got myself to it. Um, so he might like the area. So that one might not be there, but the Oilers and their deals with goalies are interesting, but you're right. Uh, Vancouver being an option. Thatcher Demko being an option. There's <laughs> little openings, but did Tristan Jari play a career? I would love for those lists to be made public. Those, Teams you cannot be trade you cannot all the trade me to. The, well, the I NHL mean, needs a little bit more drama. I think just releasing those lists alone is plenty of drama. Like right that that would one boost just when you release them in general. If you released all of them at once that are currently underway, that hundred percent would boost interest in the league for a couple weeks. And then the matchups. Oh, Tristan Jari <laughs> doesn't want to play. For his hometown Vancouver Canucks, Tristan Jari is going to get booed to hell and back when he goes to play in Vancouver. It That's just fair. it would it would increase you know intrigue in the league. The Peng not the Penguins, I mean, but they do. The NHL in general just needs more drama to to, I mean, not to keep up with it, but just to keep interest throughout the full eighty two game season because we're interested because we're lunatics and just love watching hockey for the sake of it. But as far as a national appeal standpoint. That would be huge for the NHL if they did that. More drama. That's what they need. Yeah, I'm not sure if releasing a list like that adds on a ton of drama like to, to catch them up with other sports. And the other thing no. is, I bet, you know, it doesn't. But I also bet there's something in the CBA about that. Like, I bet there's a reason why it's not released. I mean, it's probably up to – it's a, it's a player saying they don't uh, want that out. And that's fair. It's understandable. I just think well, it would be yeah. interesting if we all knew. That's it, it would be interesting, but you're 100% correct. This player doesn't want to say, hey, here's the 15 teams I don't want to go to. And then two years later, that player's on the open market, and those 15 teams go, screw off. <laughs> and, what do you want to come to us for a contract for? You didn't want to come to us two years ago. So, yeah, I, it, it's understandable why, but uh, it certainly would make for some good, good television. But yeah, but then every now and again, you get like one of the names, right? This just this past summer with the Eric Carlson deal. Uh, I don't know if Petrie, if I don't know if the Sharks were necessarily on Jeff Petrie's, but there was a reason why he wasn't going to San Jose mm -hmm. and ended up, you know, going to Detroit by way of Montreal. Um, so that would be, I forget if it was confirmed or not, if that was on his list, but uh, that like sometimes though you get well, there's trade negotiations happening and you find out like oh there is one team and this one team that we are discussing is already on this man's list so sometimes you get the one or two but you don't get the whole here's all 15 that he said here's all 10 that he said which how many numbers what's the number it's 12 for jari this year mm. so that leaves what 19 teams 
that he would be That's willing the other to go thing to. Too, yeah, it's when it's small number like that. There's still plenty of room to negotiate. Yeah, you can't really take out everybody that would be interested with those 12 teams. So uh, it makes it interesting. But again, this is August 29th. Worst case scenario talk like this is this is a very big hypothetical segment. But I think at the end of the day, he would have to perform very poorly for them to want to pull the ripcord after one season. And their expectations of him are realistic. I don't think there's, you know, I know Kyle Dubas just got to Pittsburgh, but he didn't just get into hockey. Like he, he's been around hockey. He knows hockey and the people that he surrounded himself with know hockey. And I I think it would be more of a shock to them than it would be to any of us. If Tristan Jari went out and performed that poorly this season, but regardless, um, that's worst case scenario. Um, Maybe we'll do that again with some other players. What's the worst case scenario surrounding Brian Rust this season. Uh, you know, we, we kind of talked about that in the first segment, but uh, maybe we'll bring that back because we still have a couple weeks here until training camp begins. But we're going to take a quick break right now. When we return, let's talk a little bit about number nine, or at least formerly number nine, Pascal Dupuis. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. I'm Nick Berlanski. That's Nick Horowat. We're talking Penguins here with a couple of weeks to go until the opening of the 2023 Pittsburgh Penguins training camp out in Cranberry at the UPMC Lemieux Complex. Horowat, last week, flying back from my honeymoon, land at Reagan National Airport during that flight, obviously a, a pretty decent length flight from Arizona. I'm writing down some ideas because it is the slow season. There's not a lot of news, so we have to come up with some some interesting ideas. Hence, you know, worst case scenario. Hence, talking about Tomas Tatar, despite nobody saying anything about him in over two weeks. And the flight attendant comes over the loudspeaker and says, just to let everybody know, your baggage will be in carousel nine. I'm like thinking nine, nine. Ah, let's just talk about Pascal Dupuis. So here we are, uh, three episodes later. Wanted to ask you, Horwat, where do you place Pascal Dupuy among Sidney Crosby's line mates in his career? Where do you rank him? That's that's a, that one's actually kind of a tough one because he was never really supposed to be uh, a Crosby line mate when he got here. Uh, and when it comes to the top ones, Chris Kunitz always comes to mind right away for the longevity of it. Mm-hmm. Um, Jake Gensel comes to mind for the what have you done for me lately aspect. Dupuy slots in there pretty early on just as a notable face of, do you remember those teams from the mid 2010s or a little before uh, that were good. There was one of them that wasn't. We're a good team, but couldn't get it. Couldn't really get it done. And Pascal Dupuy was a first line player for those. <laughs> That's where he yeah. slides into this conversation. It's, well, what was he doing up there? I mean, clearly there was a reason. And yeah, I think I think we look at it and we remember him early on, but I don't know how good of a linemate he really was uh, in general for Sidney mm-hmm. Crosby. And Patrick Hornquist comes to mind ahead of him. Uh, you could throw, because now here's the thing, now all the other names are going to escape me because of this. Yeah. Um, and that's also a big part of it. You forget who Crosby's played with over the years, but you remember Pascal Dupuy for so many reasons. A, he won. B, uh, he was one of those fan favorite guys, locker room mm-hmm. guy, locker room helpers, locker room veterans, and did a ton for the morale of the team. I'd say he's in the middle of the pack, though, when it comes to Sidney Crosby line mates. He's definitely above Dominic Simone. How about that? <laughs> it's funny. I do have Dominic Simone down here, but he is very, very low on yeah. the list. I, I have him. I put it into a tiered list. And I have him in a uh, tier called the others. So uh, <laughs> that's if, if you want to know how I feel about Dominic Simone's uh, ability to play with Crosby, that's where he's at. But Pascal Dupuy played nine seasons with the Pittsburgh Penguins, 452 games, 109 goals, 247 points. He also played 77 games in the postseason, scoring 14 goals and 33 points. And of course, 
you know, to keep the theme here with nines, he won the Stanley Cup with the Penguins in 2009. He was also with the team in 2016, but at that point he had already uh, been finished playing due to the the unforeseen medical circumstances that ended his career. So a good career with the Pittsburgh Penguins. You mentioned that he, you know, was on those teams that were good, but not great and couldn't succeed in the playoffs. You know, it, it's funny because at this stage now, Gensel Crosby has been together pretty much or, or getting close to as long as Kunitz Crosby was. Yeah. But people often forget that it was not just Kunitz Crosby. For a lot of those years, as you mentioned, it was Kunitz Crosby Dupuis. And the Pittsburgh Penguins did not have to worry at all about who was going to be playing on their top line. Not just because of the longevity of those three guys together, but also the chemistry of those three guys together. I have a much higher you know, thought of Pascal Dupuis when it comes to ranking him and when it comes to this list. Now, I agree with you. The top two is my top tier. And it's Chris Kunitz and it's Jake Gensel. Jake Gensel is probably a better player than Chris Kunitz ever was when it comes to individually how he is. But you look at the way that Kunitz and Crosby just complemented each other. Even in a year, in 2017, where they weren't playing together. They were not playing together. They got together to create one of the biggest goals in franchise history in Game 7 yeah. against the Ottawa Senators. Their chemistry was off the charts from the beginning to the end. And Pascal Dupuis was right there along with them. Right? I mean... For some reason, the one thing that comes to mind is I don't remember what year it was, but it was the first game of the season. Penguins at console against the Anaheim Ducks. Dupuis scores two goals. And I'm just like, man, it's it's great seeing these three back on the ice together because it was Kunitz, Crosby, Dupuis. It was early on. They scored, I think, five minutes into the game. And I was like, this is going to be a great season because that line is already clicking once again. So, you know, I would say it's it's Gensel, Kunitz, and you can argue whoever you want to argue is number one in that. I would put Dupuis in the next tier. I'd put him alongside Patrick Hornquist and Brian Rust. I think that it's those two plus Dupuis, that's the second tier for me, and that's where I put him. Do you want to know what, what year that was? What year was that? Was that the 2014-15 year that they ended up sucking? Well, yes. not sucking, but they were almost out of the playoffs. It took Brandon Sutter scoring against the Buffalo Sabres in the last game of the year. Yes. And actually that game was a bit more high flying than uh, any of us remember. It was a six to six four three. final six, four, six yeah. to four final. The Patrick Hornquist got it started. Crosby to Uh Corey Perry scored. Tw- Sorry. Corey Perry scored a hat trick. <laughs> uh, yeah. He scored. Yeah. He scored twice to open the second and then the final goal of the game. Uh, it, but somehow, Brandon Sutter, who just signed a PTO with Edmonton, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shorthanded goal a minute into the third period to for the sixth goal of the game for the Penguins. What a wild game this may have actually been. Yeah, Um, I was watching that game at Quaker Steak and Lube in Johnstown. Do you remember those? Do any of those exist? Because another one in Johnstown does not. I've never like I have not heard about them at all. So every there's gonna be a weird tangent sidebar. Every time we drive past one of the empty buildings that used to be one, me and Megan always discuss how they may have gotten completely defranchised, but some of them are coming back. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So I, I don't know the exact lore behind it, but I do remember them. Uh, I haven't eaten in one in a long time, so if they all go away, I'm not going to notice. <laughs> but the, all the buildings, and the, it's like seeing an old Pizza Hut. They're still there, and you know exactly what it was just by yeah. the building design. Uh, anyway, let's pull this back to the Penguins. <laughs> Pascal Dupuis? Yeah, yeah, I have, him, I have him in the second tier. I would say Patrick Hornfist is probably number three on my list. Um, just for the success that those, you know, those Hornfist, Crosby, Kunitz lines or Hornfist, Crosby, Gensel lines, uh, for the success that they were able to have, I, I would put Hornfist at number three. Um, just because also because he was such a change from anything that the Penguins had had. He was the most physical. He was the most domineering. He was the biggest net front presence that they had had, you know, outside of Kunitz. So I would put Hornquist at number three. And then I think it's a it's a toss-up between Rust and Dupuis. At his best, I think Rust is a better player. But Dupuis, the longevity and the consistency that he was able to have during his career in Pittsburgh, um, it was impressive. It was impressive, especially being able to be that number three guy. Uh, and still be able to eat as well as he did. I mean, he was, you know, there were times where you were looking at that line and you're like, man, Pascal Dupuis is the finisher here. And, you know, a lot of people also forget 
he was a speedster. You know, he had some blinding speed. And uh, he was able to keep up with Crosby better than Kunitz was. But Kunitz was that, you know, change of pace, big guy, even though he wasn't that big. But, you know, Kunitz used to lay the body pretty good. Mm-hmm. So did so did Dupuis for what it's worth. A couple seasons, yeah. well over 100 hits. Uh, and I just look at the last four recorded seasons from Dupuis and go, wow, we really – or at least three of the last four, because that last one's a bit of a struggle, but we know why. Yeah. Um, but the 48 game shortened season, he had 38 total points of 20 goals. That's a pretty solid year. And 20 he was goals in 48 games. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely, he was definitely playing alongside Sidney Crosby there because that was the year. Oh wait, no, things get weird. Cause that was the Malkin Kunitz year. Um, but he follows up that with a 39 game season and 20 points. Then in in the 14-15 season that we just discussed with the Anaheim Ducks game, he only played 16 games that year, but had 11 points. Yeah. 11. I think he had like four in that first game. But it's <laughs> it's still pretty ridiculous that we underrate him in terms of scoring and just kind of know him as a line mate. Yet, I mean, it, in these – close to the end of his career he was putting up some pretty decent numbers here so yeah you got to give him that boost i mean i came up with my answer without looking at the sheer numbers of it Mm -hmm. and just kind of knowing he was always the guy that definitely wasn't as skilled as many of the others on the list that you would that you might list off but uh was there for the longevity and you know had plenty of speed could throw the body and could play defense Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, To finish out this list, here's the other tiers that I had, and I probably missed a couple here and there, but, you know, above average, I'd say Connor Sherry. Um, I'd say Mark Recchi, because it was towards the tail end of his career, even though he did go on to play another like seven years in the NHL. He he didn't play too long uh, with Sidney Crosby, but I put Mark Recchi in there. Colby Armstrong, I would put in in that third tier. Bill Guerin, I would also put in that third tier. Again, didn't play for very long alongside Sidney Crosby. And then there's the others. I'd put Dom Simone and Ryan Malone. Like That's where I would have those two. I don't totally hate that, but my light just shut off. So uh... I saw that. I saw it. It got pretty dark on the other side of the screen there. <laughs> it didn't want but... to hear anyone else on this list. It, it, it's had enough. It said, you know, I don't want to hear about Connor Sherry. Come on, man. Like, don't don't talk to me about that guy. But no, uh, Sherry, you know, all these guys. It's interesting because you think of Crosby line mates. The first one you think of is usually, you know, Chris Kunitz besides Jake Gensel, who's up there now. I think Ricard Raquel, after a couple more seasons, could probably jump up this list. You know, I didn't put him on this list because it's only been one year and, you know, he only played, I guess, Recky only played like one or two years with Crosby mm-hmm. and same with Garen. So I guess he'd probably be in the above average right now, but that longevity could put him into that maybe tier two, maybe above uh, Dupuis if he plays out the rest of his career and Crosby's still playing the next five years and they're still succeeding as well as they did last year. He's got five years to work with, so you got plenty of time to yeah. knock it out of the park. Yeah, it's insane how many different eras there are, like sub eras in the Sidney Crosby era. So. Uh, but regardless, you know, Pascal Dupuis wanted to give him a little bit of light. Nobody really talks about Dupuis all that much. So uh, there you go. Um, late August, early September. That's 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 the wheelhouse for Duper. Um, but that is going to do it for this episode of the tip of the iceberg. Man, we need training camp to start. Uh, we will be back on Thursday talking a little bit about international hockey as it looks like the NHL and the NHLPA are hoping to get something going on that front. We're going to have a nice little uh, fun experiment on Thursday's episode, talk about the Penguins and which of them could win in an international three-on-three tournament. We'll see you guys then. 